Okay, increasing conflict and war. This basically is going to be the period from 1805 to 1815. We're going to be going uh, from Thomas Jefferson's not as popular second term uh, up through the end of the War of 1812 and its ramifications for America. Ready to go to the next slide? Troubling currents in Jefferson's America. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, emerging factions in American politics. Now guys, as you can guess, the other political party isn't going to be so happy with you. And you have a Federalist threat uh, against Thomas Jefferson. Basically, this was led by Timothy Pickering and his Essex Junto. A junto basically is a group or an organization. Usually guys you get together and have drinks with. Anyway, they believe that their interests up in New England could no longer succeed under the Republican Democrats. He said the people of the East cannot reconcile their habits, views, and interest with those of the South and the West. These guys threatened to cede from the United States of America. So way before the Civil War, it was actually the North that first threatened cession. Now you kind of expect uh, people to be against you from the other political party, but Thomas Jefferson found the Republican Democrats also divided. Basically, John Randolph of Virginia opposed the expansion of the government's power underneath Thomas Jefferson especially his uh, solution to what was called the Yazoo controversy now right here is the Yazoo River and basically what happened up here in this section three different companies got together and bought up a whole lot of land from uh, at way under market value and then turned around and sold it for like twice as much as they paid for it they sold it basically to state governments and Randolph was infuriated by this because Thomas Jefferson said, hey, it's a state problem, not a federal one. They were the ones that sold the land. And then when he hears that Jefferson tried to buy Florida from Spain, he just splits off and he forms a third party called the Tertium Quid. Now, tertium quid might sound real, ooh, curious, but in Latin, all tertium quid means is the third thing. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, now we got to talk about Aaron Burr. Uh, by 1804. Times for Burr had not been favorable. I mean, ever since he had refused to step down and let Thomas, Jeff let Thomas Jefferson be the president and he'd be the vice president, he had lost a lot of favor. I mean, like Jefferson didn't call on him much 
when he was vice president and then totally drops him from the ticket in the election of 1804? Well, so what Burr decides to do then is he decides to switch parties to the Federalist Party. He wants to run as governor of New York. And he promises uh, the Essex Junto that if they help him get elected, that he would help... Um, you know, stand up for the rights and help them uh, seed from the Union. While this makes the granddaddy of the Federalist Party, Alexander Hamilton, furious. And Hamilton proclaimed Burr a dangerous man, one who ought not to be trusted with the reins of government. Burr loses the election, and of course, who do you think he blames? Hamilton. Indeed, he's so infuriated that he challenges Hamilton to a duel. You ready? Basically, they were going to meet at Weehawken, New Jersey, right across from New York, because dueling wasn't legal in New York. And all of Hamilton's friends say, just, just apologize, just apologize. Take back what you said. Hamilton says, well, I'm sorry if my words hurt him. But I'm not going to take back what I said, because basically by this time in his life, you know, his political party isn't in favor. He's kind of running low on money. Um, and about all he has left is his word. So they meet out at uh, in New Jersey. And they march off their... Uh, they march off their steps... And they turn around, Hamilton points his gun right at him, and fires. Well, he doesn't fire, his gun misfires. So now Hamilton can take all the time he wants to, to make sure that he hits Aaron Burr. Instead, what he does is he raises his gun in the air, and he fires off his shot. That way, both men have met on the field of battle and defended their honor, and they could leave peaceably. Well, this so angers uh, Burr that he grabs his second pistol, and he levels it at Hamilton, and he fires. He hits him in the gut. The bullet goes down into his liver, and it takes uh, Hamilton... 36 hours of grueling pain before he finally dies. And of course, now that he's dead, uh, everybody loves him. Alexander Hamilton is on the run. And while he's down in... Uh, While he's out in the West, he runs into General James Wilkinson. He was our top uh, military guy out there, who was also a secret agent in the service of Spain and Britain. And basically, he wanted to strip off lands from Western Tennessee and Kentucky and try to expand uh, his power in the West and start a new republic. And he asks um, Hamilton, I mean Burr, hey, you want to work with me? And Burr says, yeah. And so basically he gets in on it. 
but then Wilkinson's plan is exposed. But before they can capture Alexander Hamilton, he makes a run for it, and he gets caught as he's trying to pass into Spanish Florida. And guys, this is just what Thomas Jefferson wanted. He's going to find him guilty now because he plotted against the United States. He goes around and he offers freedom for anybody who will turn state's evidence against Aaron Burr. But Chief Justice John Marshall um, allows Burr to testify, to provide witnesses. And basically, uh, at the end of the day, because Burr had not fought an active war against the United States, he couldn't be found guilty of treason. So, he was released. Ready to go to the next slide? Okay, so peace had broken out in Europe, which was very costly to us. I mean, American exports fell from $93 million to $72 million, the first year of peace, and the second year of peace, it fell by $56 million. But, all of a sudden, war breaks out in Europe again, which is great for us, because our exports grew 65%. Now, why did they grow like this? Well, because in war, they were using all of their labor to make munitions of war and not farm. And remember, we were farmers, so they needed to buy our crops. And not just our crops, but the re-exports to Europe actually grew. Now, what are re-exports? Re-exports are where they manufacture the parts in one country, they ship it, to another country, they would assemble the parts and reship them back to the home country. Kind of like here in uh, the Warring Nations, they might make the lock, stock, and barrel of a rifle as three separate parts. They'd send it to us, we'd put it together as a rifle and ship it back to them. Kind of like we currently do with some of our cars in Mexico. Re-exports went from $14 million worth back in 1803 to $42.1 million worth in 1807. Ready to go to the next line? But we have problems with being a neutral because the friend of my enemy is my enemy. And everybody is fighting at this time, so everybody has enemies. And um, America tried to be neutral in the war, but we faced increasing pressure from the warring powers to pick a side, like England. They seized British sailors on American vessels, as many as 8,000 from 1803 to 1812 and impressed basically means they take you uh, from one place and put you into service in the British military. For example, the Scotsman who was the Galloway that came over here to America, he was a Scotsman. He was impressed by the British Navy. 
and forced to serve with them for seven years. Well, France, they passed the Berlin Decree, which barred neutral ships from landing at French ports if they'd been to English ports first. So for most of the American captains, it was like, oh, well, okay then, we'll just drop off our load in France before we take it to England. England, however, not wanting to be outdone, they passed the Orders in Council that required all neutral vessels going to Europe to first stop at a British port and pay a tax. So see, both sides are trying to get us to choose a side. Ready? Well, towards economic war, efforts by the Europeans to enforce their policies led to severe tension with the United States. For example, back in June of 1807, the Chesapeake an American merchantman was in American territorial waters. Everything 20 miles off our coast is American waters, except for Texas. Texas is the only state where 20 miles off our coast, that's Texas. And uh, a British uh, frigate, the HMS Leopard, basically entered into our waters. It fired a warning shot for the Chesapeake to stop. The Chesapeake, of course, didn't because England didn't have any authority in our waters to do that. And so the leopard opens up a broadside on the Chesapeake, killing three men, wounding 18, and damaging the ship severely. Then to add insult to injury, they board the Chesapeake and take off four sailors. Well, almost immediately after this, France passed the Milan Decree saying that it would seize neutral ships that traded with England or had been boarded by English impressment parties. So basically to preserve neutrality, Jefferson decides to embargo all trade with Europe. Ready to go to the next slide? The crisis in the nation. Now guys, it might have seemed like the honorable thing to have done, this embargo, but it caused a huge depression. Getting ready to go to the next slide. The Depression of 1808. The dam bargo, as critics called it, caused a severe depression. I mean, our shipping fell from $109 million worth of goods down to only $22 million. Northeastern shipping crashed. In New York City alone, 30,000 sailors were laid off. 
120 businesses went bankrupt and 1,200 New Yorkers are in prison for debt? They started to spell embargo backwards, oh grab me, to describe what the um, embargo was doing to their wealth. Now remember, it's not just the North that's hurt, because agricultural exports from the South went down sharply, like tobacco prices fell from $6.75 a hundredweight down to only $3.25. Cotton fell from $0.21 cents to $0.13 cents a pound. Meanwhile, Western foodstuffs were 16% lower than the price they had been back in 1793. Meanwhile, the price of consumer goods goes up. And textiles by as much as 11 to 20%. Why? Because less people are buying them. And the manufacturers have to make money. Now this, however, is willing, uh, if you're willing to go by the game. If you wanted to get into smuggling, you could make incredible profits. Like you buy your cotton at Charleston at a 40% discount, sell it in London at a 233% markup, giving you a 300% profit, and because many officials were disgusted at what the embargo was doing and how many people that it was putting out of work, they let your ships pass. So that's what's going on on the East Coast. Let's find out what's going on in the West. The Prophet, Tecumseh, and the Western Warhawks. Basically out west, a religious and cultural revival had arisen amongst the Native Americans. Basically this was being led by the Prophet, whose original name uh, was Lala Wakitha, or Noisy One, or Loudmouth. Basically, he was a drunk who went into the forest, the wilderness, and had a road to Damascus uh, experience, where he saw the Maker, And uh, the maker gave him a new name, Tenskuwata, meaning open door. And basically he was to establish the community of Prophetstown where his followers gathered. Now remember, many of his followers had been displaced by the Treaty of Greenville. when the Americans beat the Native Americans at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And at first the prophet um, preached nonviolence, but later on he advocated resistance by the Indians. And basically the promise that the maker had given to them was that if they returned back to the ways of old, God would return the land to them.
Ready to go to the next slide? Now he's joined at Prophetstown by Tecumseh, who was the son of a Shawnee tree chief. And basically he excelled at organizing the frontier Indians into a confederation to fight against white uh, encroachment and oppression. Well, the territorial governor of Indiana, William Henry Harrison, saw what he was doing and it made him kind of scared. And he tells Washington, D.C. that these uh, Native Americans that are organizing have to be British agents. And the Westerners begin to advocate for war with Britain. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, how, what would we get out of going to war with Britain? Well, it would break up the emerging Indian confederations. We could go up and take over Canada. It would secure American control of the Northwest. And a lot of people blamed England for the Depression of 1808. Even though in reality it was both kind of England and France forcing us to choose a side. Okay, next slide. Well, choosing a war. Before we get to going to war, there's an election where James Madison's easy victory for the presidency disguised the division that was in the nation. Like the Federalists, they attracted strong support because of the, Debre because of the depression caused by the embargo. And remember, it's not just the Federalists they were running against, but you also had uh, the Southern Republican Democrats, the Tertium Quids, that had attempted to nominate James Monroe. Northeastern Republican Democrats, meanwhile, they tried to elect George Clinton popular New York governor because of the embargo now in this election the Republican Democrat strength increased in the congressional elections but these new Republican Democrat legislatures they were war hawks. They did not support Madison's moderate approach to England. They wanted war. And early in 1811, Madison was forced to suspend all trade with the British. And basically the reason why Madison had to do that is because France used Macon's Bill Number 2 
which required a suspension of all trade with England if we wanted to trade with France. And if you remember, the Republican Democrats did favor France. But guys, it's not events in the uh, East that kind of put pressure for war. It's events out in the West. Basically, Tecumseh and Governor William Henry Harrison reached a stalemate over the Fort Wayne Treaty. They couldn't, I mean, they couldn't get together on having a peaceful treaty. So Tecumseh tells the prophet, hey look, I'm going out, I'm gonna be doing something, don't mess with anything, don't make any deals, and I'll be back. And the prophet says, okay. Meanwhile, Governor William Henry Harrison, he assembled an army at Prophetstown because of an isolated Indian raid elsewhere. and the Native Americans at Provincetown, this looks like an answer to the maker's desire. Because they went back to the ways of old, and here's the U.S. Army, and God gave us the U.S. Army here, and now we're going to go attack them and win. So all the, all the uh, Indian warriors were getting terribly excited about it, um, and they kind of forced the prophet to attack the U.S. Army. And the uh, Prophet's forces actually caught the U.S. Army off guard, causing them to reel back just a little bit. But then Harrison uh, orders a counterattack, and they're able to defeat the Native Americans and afterwards Harrison is looking around at all the dead bodies he sees where the prophet is but he can't find Tecumseh and when he can't find Tecumseh he goes oh shoot and uh, Harrison basically requested federal military support against what he claimed what a Brit was a British Indian declaration of war. So Congress declares war on Britain. Ready to go to the next slide? The Nation at War. The fighting begins. Okay, guys, basically we launch a three-pronged attack into Canada. And we think, hey, we're going to be pretty successful because a lot of the guys that used to be Americans had moved over to Canada. So they're going to be like us. We went and we uh, tried to capture, we laid siege to uh, the territorial capital of York which today is called Toronto and we lay siege to it we tried to take over Fort York before they evacuated the fork uh, the fort the British uh, set fire to their munitions dump which made their uh, gunpowder explode sending out shrapnel that killed like 200 Americans which really made infuriated the Americans and they started taking it out on the people of York which quickly soured them against American rule the British militia militia was able to chase us out
Now, we did have some uh, successful raids against Native American uh, villages. And what proved much more successful was the naval war. Several British ships up in the Great Lakes were sunk. And of course, because we didn't have a huge navy, the American government put out a deal. Hey, if you're a merchant man and you want to become a pirate in the service of America, go for it. So you had a lot of merchant captains that converted their ships and loaded them up with cannons and were able to capture many British vessels. But guys, we didn't get the immediate success that we thought we would. Getting ready to go to the next slide. And so you have the election of 1812, where um, it reflected kind of the misgivings about our war. I mean, Madison wins, but barely. And the Republican Democrat strength and Congress diminished. And the Federalists, they supported DeWitt Clinton, who was a Northeastern Republican Democrat who had been opposed to the war. And the reason why the Federalists did that is because they were opposed to the war. So is 1812 all bad news? Well, no. Again, we were able to score some victories on Lake Erie, but militarily in the north, both sides just kind of harass each other. Even though now Tecumseh, who was a British agent, now, not back when we were messing with him, but now he's fighting with them. Uh, the American army does a foray into Canada and attacks a Native American village and Tecumseh is killed in that raid. But then you have the Fort Mims Massacre. There it is right there. Because what Tecumseh had done when the treaty broke down between him and Harrison is he traveled south to build up a confederation of Native Americans. He went down to like in between Tennessee and Georgia, which was the frontier. And he, he gathered the Red Stick Faction, which basically was a group of Native American tribes. He'd go to one and he'd say, hey, you want to be with me? Attack Fort Mims. Uh, he'd give them a batch of like 30 sticks. And he'd say, take away one stick each day. And when you have no more sticks left, you need to be at Fort Mims and attack it. And let's say he traveled... Thir three days to go to the next tribe. Well, he'd give them 27 sticks and say, take one away every day at when you're out of sticks, basically attack Fort Mims, and so on and so forth. And through this, basically, he was able to build up that confederation, and the Indians totally surprise the 500 pioneer families who were residing at the fort so if we were say there was five people to a family, that would make 2,500 people. 
and the Indians killed all but on, all but 36 of them. Only 36 people were able to escape. Well, as you can guess, Tennessee and Georgia, they rise up and carry out retaliatory strikes. Inflicting severe losses to the Red Sticks. Meanwhile, the British seize control of the Atlantic. They basically blockade our ships in port, which they can easily do. Because they had the world's most powerful navy at the time. Ready to go to the next slide? Well, the politics of war. Negotiations in the war with the British begin at the end of 1813. But guys, if you want to negotiate, you want to negotiate from a position of strength rather than weakness. So the army size was increased and they offered incentives to people to come out and join the army and to get enlistments. Well, you're going to need more money to do that. So Congress authorized a loan with new treasury notes being printed out. Ready to go to the next slide? Congress enacts the Embargo of 1813. Basically, Congress uh, passed an embargo specifically against Britain with neutral ships. In other words, we're not going to sell any of our goods to anybody who's going to trade with England. Now, of course, you know this is political because pretty much our ships are blockaded in port as it is. But this further ban and restriction on trade affected the economies of all the states, especially those in the east. And then the worst possible thing happens for America. New British offenses. Peace with France. France was defeated. So now England, they could fight us with both hands. Okay. So England prepares a three-pronged offensive. One was going to push down and invade Plattsburgh, New York. That one was turned back. Then the British landed some troops off the Chesapeake uh, Bay and they were going to march in and take over Baltimore. And along their way they were going to burn Washington, D.C., kind of as a retaliation to what we did to Fort York, which they were able to do. But they failed to take Baltimore. But then the British began to move from Pensacola in Spanish Florida towards New Orleans. And guys, we had to protect New Orleans. 
Ready to go to the next slide? Well, who was going to be the guy who was going to protect it for us? Well, a guy by the name of Andrew Jackson was in charge of the military defense of the entire Gulf Coast. And he had to come down and before he even gave battle to the English, he had to defeat the Creeks at a battle of Horseshoe Bend, where there was a bend in the river that was kind of like a horseshoe. Basically, they forced the uh, Creeks to, uh, they felled trees and as defenses, and then they had the river all the way around them and the Americans were on the other side and a young lieutenant in Sam Houston's army uh, to excite the troops climbed to the top of the of the log pile and said come on boys who will come fight with me and he got shot in the thigh with an arrow well what did this young lieutenant do he pushed the arrow out to where it was um, sticking through the other side of his thigh. He grabbed that and he pulled the uh, arrow out of his thigh, said, come on boys, took about two steps and collapsed due to loss of blood. Well, all of his men were so excited by this though that they climbed the log pile and they were able to defeat the Red Stick Creeks at Horseshoe Bend. And um, Andrew Jackson was so taken back by this young man's courage that uh, he had his own personal doctor take care of him. And that young lieutenant was healed. And does anybody know the name of this young lieutenant? Sam Houston, the guy who would later become president of the Republic of Texas. But now that the, he didn't have time to congratulate himself in that victory at Horseshoe Bend because now he had to rush down to uh, New Orleans to defeat the British. I mean, he was trying to get everybody good. He uh, opened up all the jails. He made deals with pirates like Lafitte. Um, he uh, had slaves with him. Basically, it was a... Um, a motley crew of only 4,000 people that they had to build defenses and everything like that. Meanwhile, the British had more than 6,000 veteran troops that had just come from defeating Napoleon. Well, uh, Andy Jackson sets up his defenses uh, behind a wall. The British come marching towards them. Indeed, the British general Pakenham was one of the generals who helped defeat Napoleon, was leading the British. We only had about 4,000 people. But one of the biggest things to our advantage was that uh, Pakenham was one of the first people to die. And the people below him didn't really know how to adopt and adapt his plans. So they kept going like it was as normal. There was a cypress grove up here, so they couldn't really get through that. They had to attack this wall. And basically, Andy Jackson, they just poured shot after shot into the British. And when the smoke was cleared, more than 2,000 British had been killed or wounded, with several hundred more captured. Well, what about the Americans? Remember, they were numbered more than us. Well, we suffered eight killed and 13 wounded. Guys, this was an incredible victory. An astounding victory. Oh, but by the way, guys, I don't know how to tell you this, but the war was already over. The Battle of New Orleans was fought after they signed the Treaty of Ghent in the war's strange conclusion. Basically, in the Treaty of Ghent, 
There was no territorial exchanges. Um, it's, we'll call it the Treaty of Do-Over. Because it merely ended the war and restored our diplomatic relations. Now, why was England so willing to let us off like that? Well, the reason why England was willing to let this thing go and get back to Europe is because Napoleon was on the rise again. Ready to go to the next slide? Now, the rise of new expectations. Now, guys, we may have won our independence in the Revolutionary War, but it was the War of 1812 that made us a nation, where we start thinking about the nation more than we think of just being a citizen of our state. Ready to go to the next slide? There's new expectations in the Northeastern economy. Basically cut off from European manufactured goods, Americans started to make more textiles and other items for themselves. Now we had done this earlier with like home textile production under Samuel Slater in the 1790s, but the British cloth was still cheaper. It was during the war that uh, Francis Cabot Lowell goes over to England and basically he talked to industrialists who were more than happy to let him see their machines because they were bragging about it and he'd listen, he'd look, and then after that meeting, he'd rush back to his hotel and quickly draw out everything he had seen and the way they were doing it. And he visited a whole lot of factories, so he was able to get a lot of information. He comes back over to America, and they start building factories based on those that he had seen in England. And these factories in New England eventually supply more and more of the country's consumer goods. Changing the economic roles as well as hopes of many Americans in the Northeast. Ready to go to the next slide? Meanwhile, we have a revolution in the southern economy. Basically, technological and economic changes in the war's wake pumped new energy into the south's economy. The mechanization of the British uh, textile industry by the late 18th century brought dramatic changes. They had a voracious appetite for our cotton. And Eli Whitney came up with something called the cotton gin that could mechanically take, separate the seeds from the cotton fiber. allowing one man in one hour to produce what it used to take 10 people one day to do. Now some people say he got the idea for this invention from uh, Catherine Green, a wealthy plantation owner. But basically what this machine also did was it made it to where you could now grow short staple cotton, 
which had a very high seed to fiber ratio. Before this, most people just grew uh, the long staple cotton that had a low seed to fiber ratio. The reason why they um, short staple cotton, it took too long to separate the seeds from the cotton fiber. But now that a machine was doing it, it didn't matter. And short staple cotton could grow almost anywhere. So now people spread out like mad to grow cotton. And indeed, uh, America supplied two-thirds of the world's cotton and 80% of Britain's cotton demands. So this was hugely important. Ready to go to the last slide? Meanwhile, you had new opportunities out west. Uh, as the economy began to recover, many rushed to the frontier to seek their fortunes. And I mean, Jackson's victories against the Red Stick Creeks removed all meaningful resistance to westward expansion in the south. And collaboration between the United States and Native Americans helped to prevent renewed warfare. So joint efforts by individual farmers and business tycoons really opened up the West. Preparing America for an explosion that's going to happen next lecture.